Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your very, very last Physics 30 video. I know, can you believe it? It seems like ages ago when I first started filming these things for you guys, when, when COVID first hit, and here we are on the ultimate last physics video that I will be filming for you guys in 2020. I know, it's nuts, nuts. Okay, ready to begin? All right. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to talk a little bit about the most modern version of the atom that we have today. Now, I'm going to give you guys a forewarning here. This is ultra simplified, like beyond ultra simplified. We're not even going to be talking about the whys and the hows here. We're just going to be talking about the what. And as we all know, the what is not always the most important part of physics. And truly, the answers aren't even the most po most important part. As every experiment that you do, you may answer a couple of questions, but you're going to come up with a thousand more. So it's the thing with science. It's not always about having all the right answers. It's being able to ask the right questions. Exactly. Okie dokie. So keep in mind, super, super simplified. You could spend your entire life studying nucleons and these other diminutive subatomic particles and you'd still not have all the answers. So keep all this in mind that this is ultra, ultra, ultra introductory here. Sounds good? Cool. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, what we've got with our current understanding of the model of, of atoms is that while well, we started out with a simple indivisible math, mass like a billiard ball, whereas now we've got this ridiculously complex theory with a zillion subatomic particles, I swear, and their diminutive size. So like quarks, leptons, bosons, fermions, mesons, hadrons, etc., etc. Now, this, this is cool. I, I just noticed something. You guys know the book Dynamicist that I've been talking about all the time? Oh, that's really cool. One of the main characters, um, well, or what would say characters? Um, one of the, uh, the uh, like angels in the book who's referred to as Hadron. And there she is. There's Hadron um, on the front cover. And uh, she is protecting a child from uh, Nimriel. So pretty cool. I have to check with uh, with the author, but um, I uh, I'll have to ask him to see if he actually named the character after that subatomic particle. Which, considering, put that back on the shelf. Um, considering Lee's a physicist or retired physicist, I'm fairly certain it may have been named after a subatomic particle which I think is so cool. All right, back to physics. Um, so if you still haven't read Dynamicist in the second book, Harold, get on it. Um, Harold's out now, the second book. Okay, it's awesome. Second book is great. And for those of you who are Dungeons and Dragons fans, you'll see there are definitely uh, D10s on the front. Yeah, absolutely, it's a thing. Okay, put that book back. Okay. All right, back to physics. But seriously, read those books. They're so good. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, our standard model is where we describe the nature of our atoms using in terms of our 12 fundamental particles, okay? So, and the different categories of these fundamental particles. Now, and as well as the fundamental forces that are going to be interacting with these particles. So the interactions between all of these fundamental particles is going to be categorized into these four forces. So these guys are the strongest and all the way down to the weakest. Okay. All right. So these strong nuclear forces, these are the ones that hold the nucleus and quarks together. And these things act just within the nucleus itself. Like they're within the nuclear range. Like they, they don't act very far at all. Now we already talked a ton about electromagnetic forces in our second unit. And these guys here, this is our attraction or repulsion between charged particles. We're already covered that. And as we talked about, the range is technically infinite. Um, although once you get past a certain radius, then the numbers become negligible. So weak nuclear, uh, these guys, this is the transmutation of quarks. 
okay, into your beta negative and beta positive decay. And these, once again, only react within the nucleus. And last but certainly not least, which we definitely studied in physics 20, is gravitational, and it's for the attraction between two masses. We're already, we already did that in physics 20. And tactically, as we learned then as well, the range is technically infinite, but after you get away past a certain radius, then it's negligible. And when the mass is small enough, you don't even really see it, like my stylus and my pen. Sure, there's maybe a gravitational force of attraction between them, but they're not flinging towards each other. Okay. So, whoops, come on, computer, behave. There we go. So, ladies and gentlemen, very, very brief um, about how we can even detect these and how we know they exist. Well, if, if a physicist is going to be able to break an atom down into these subatomic particles, well, first of all, and heck, like to break neutrons and protons down, you need a ridiculous amount of energy. So to overcome these strong nuclear forces, which is holding them together. So what you need is something like the Hadron Collider in Switzerland. Yeah, Hadron Collider. So you are going to be accelerating some of these atoms with, to ridiculously high speeds. They have to be like, like stupidly fast, okay? Um, so that's only half the battle though. What's the point in breaking these things down into their, into their diminutive subatomic particles if you can't detect them? So you have to be, have a method to detect their existence. So what do we have? Scientists came up with bubble and cloud chambers, which can track this path of these small subatomic particles. And the sad thing is they, they attract, they track charged particles, but not neutral particles. Neutral particles are ridiculously difficult to detect. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, we've got two possibilities. We've got a bubble chamber and a cloud chamber. And so the, the tricky part with this one, the cloud chamber, so dust free, super saturated air with a vapor from a liquid, I go um, from my like water or ethanol, for example. Now, dust free air. That is stupidly, also stupidly difficult in order to get. So like this, this isn't some like, oh, boil some water type deal. This is, this is tough. Um, you're going to have your liquefied gas that's just just on the verge of boiling, like just on the verge of boiling. So some, there's some serious temperature control going on here, and that's not going to be perfectly easy to do. So this isn't as simple as it looks or sounds, I guess. So what a charged particle, keyword charged particle. So sadly, neutrinos, not detected here. Um, they're going to be going to either cause the vapor in the cloud to condense into bubble or droplets or the liquefied gas to vaporize and you're going to get bubbles. Okay. So on either way, you're going to have a track left behind by these particles that can then be detected. And as I mentioned, sad face, neutral particles don't make tracks. Tear. Okay. So how neutral particles are detected story for another day. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, just this uh, fun picture here is just showing some of the, the tracks through one of the chambers, which is pretty cool. So what you can do is you can apply an external magnetic field. See, we're coming back here. So that's going to cause these charged particles to move in a circular path, which can then help you identify what they are. Well, how is that going to be helpful? How, what can we know about this? Math time. Let's get the math to figure out how this is going to be useful. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is going. To, there's going to be some seriously uh, cool stuff going on. So, oh, and then these these hadron colliders are like cutting edge physics right now. And so, we're some of the stuff we're looking at is sh like showing why this stuff is important, why we're doing this in high school physics as well. We need some of these concepts to apply to the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we've got three tracks left behind and we've got a, one's a proton, electron, and one is going to be 
and we're going to need a positron. Now, positron is actually not drawn on here. So we need to draw our positron in here and figure out what the other line is. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need to identify the path for each particle. Okay. Well, how do we know this? Well, let's do some math. Now, this, remember, these dots are representing our strength of our um, mag stutter magnetic field that is coming out of the plane of the page. Okay. And we're going to be needing to use left hand rule. And which one? One, two, or three? Three. Good job. Um, in order to determine which say they're going. However, positive particle, which hand do we need? Right hand for a negative particle, left hand. So with our math, remember from our previous unit, that's the most ridiculous looking F. There we go. So please remember that your FC is equal to FM. Okay. So with our our FM is QVB perpendicular and your FC is MAC. Well, with QVB perpendicular and we expand that AC and we're going to be using our V squared over R. Well, we've got V here. We're going to cancel that out. QB perpendicular is going to equal MV over R. Okay, well, looking at this, ladies and gentlemen, what is the relationship between the mass and the radius? And how can we determine that? Well, let's multiply my mass over. I'm going to multiply the mass over. So RQB perpendicular is going to equal MV. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what we've got is the radius is going to be directly proportionate to the mass. So that is helpful. Okay. So the larger the radius, the larger the mass. And we can determine the direction of curvature based on our left hand rules. Okay. So let's start with this red line here. Let's determine what this could, what this could possibly be. Well, this guy here, ladies and gentlemen, has got a fairly large curvature. Well, which of these has a large mass? No, relatively large mass. Proton. So it would make sense that this larger mass would have a larger radius of curvature. Well, let's see if the direction actually makes sense because we need to use your third hand rule here in order to actually determine the direction of curvature. So this is going to be a, I'm going to, because I'm hypothesizing it's going to be a proton because of its radius. I'm going to start with my right hand. Okay. So I am going to have my thumb, okay, pointing in the direction of the what, ladies and gentlemen? Where does the thumb go? Hammer back. More issues. Tech as always, of course. So we're just going to write out here uh, some of the significant parts that we just calculated and hope you guys wrote down already. So we know that our mass is proportional to the radius and we know that we're going to need to use our third left hand rule. So our third hand rule in this case, because I predicted about the proton, we use my right hand. Now your thumb is the direction of the charged particle. Your finger is going to be the direction of the magnetic field and your palm is going to be the direction of the magnetic force. So, or you could use, um, hold your hand like this as if you choose to do that as well. So I'm going to hold my thumb in the direction of the charged particle where it is going to be moving. Okay. Which is going that way. And then my magnetic field is coming out of the page like this. So the force is going to be going that way on the page. This is really a rather awkward looking pose. So while well, I use my right hand, so which is for positive charges and look at this, it's curving this way. And the force we determined on this guy would be pointing that way. So that makes sense. And because of the large radius, a proton makes sense. Okay. Well, we have these guys here, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm also going to rewrite out this guy here. I want our Q B perpendicular is equal to MV. Okay. I want that there. So ladies and gentlemen, 
Let's now, I need to look at my electron and my positron. Well, I have got a bit of a problem here. Are any of these positrons? No, they're not. The direction of the curvature is opposite. So we are going to need to draw in our positron. So let us do this first. Why not? Positrons. So the direction is going to be the same here. Okay, let's put my positron here. The direction is going to be the same as the proton. Why? Because of the charge. What about its radius? Well, mass is directly proportionate to the radius. Because a positron has significantly smaller mass, it is going to be curving like that. It's going to have a significantly smaller radius of curvature. Sounds good? All right. So that's our positron. Well, now we've got two of these things. Well, let's determine about, think about our electrons. Well, for this one, we are going to have our left hand rule, okay, because negative particles, so you use your left hand. Now, with your left hand, you want your thumb to be the direction the particle's traveling, so that way. And then you want your fingers to be pointing in the direction of the magnetic field, which is that way. And then the force is the palm, so it's going to be going that way. Okay, well, that makes sense. I'm going to use do my writing in blue here to fit with the colors. So that would mean our force is going this way. So it's going to result in a curvature this way. So that guy could be our electron. Well, what about this guy? Well, it's got the same curvature, but it's or the same direction. It's got a larger radius. We don't have a lot of big particles. So our, it's not the mass that's going to be larger here. What could be larger? What about the velocity? So this guy, let's rearrange this guy. So if we take, um, I'm going to bring my V over. So if I have V, Q, B perpendicular, oh, I dropped the R there, and it's going to equal my M. Well, look at this, V and, um, I didn't need to write that out. I'm sorry, guys, I'm having a Monday. And it's only Tuesday. Well, if we look at this guy, our velocity and radius, they're already on the opposite side. So our radius is going to be directly proportional to mass again. I didn't want to write mass. Full Monday, okay, is proportionate to the velocity. So because the velocity is directly proportionate to the radius, this guy here could be an electron at a higher speed. Sounds good? Our radio. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at this next one. List three types of subatomic particles which do not leave tracks inside a bubble or a gas chamber. So, is that with this bubble chamber, ladies and gentlemen? Remember, it's neutral particles that don't leave tracks. So, the most obvious one is our neutron. I'll think back to our previous sets of notes in our previous lessons. We have our neutrinos and your anti, that's, there we go, neutrinos that are all neutral. So it could be anything that is neutral. Yeah. Um, but these are just the three ones that we've looked at. Okie dokie. All right. So for our next question here, uh, describe and explain the differences in the tracks made in a bubble chamber by the particles. Okay, so protons and alpha particles. Well, for A here, we are looking at some of the similarities. Okay. For this one, they are going to have the same direction of curvature. Why is that? Both positive charge. Because they both have a positive charge, they're going to behave the same in a magnet or the same direction in a magnetic field. Now, however, remember, ladies and gentlemen, when we go back up to our um, equation, we can get the radius is going to be proportionate to the mass over Q. Okay. Um, 
And so we can derive this, um, go, try deriving it. Yeah, go derive it. Go make this. See why that actually makes sense. So because the radius is, is directly proportionate to mass over the charge, when we look at this here, the mass is going to have a greater impact on the radius here. Well, the charge for a proton is plus one. This one is plus two. But the mass is going to is four on an alpha particle. So that would mean the radius on an alpha particle is going to be double that of the um, proton. Sorry, my stutter is so bad today. Okay, so because of this, the radius on your alpha particle is going to equal double that of a proton. Okay? All right. So for B, protons and electrons. Well, for this one, you're going to have opposite directions of curvature um, because of their opposite charges. Okay, they're going to react opposite directions in a magnetic field. What's also going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, is that because of this again, you're going to have a larger radius off the curvature in your proton because of its, in, its larger mass. Sounds good, guys? All right. So I'm going to scroll down here. Now, this is, we're going to look at very briefly here with our really subatomic particles. So one of these really teeny guys it was discovered, and it's a really important one to this standard model. It's called a cork. Now, a cork um, is a subatomic particle that have fractional charges. So charges less than our elementary charge. All right, so charge or less than our 1.67 times 10 to the power of negative 19. Okay, so we have um, the name or flavor of our cork. Sadly, no, we don't have chocolate corks. I know, it's a shame. So we have an up cork, okay, and the up corks um, have a charge of positive two thirds. Okay, and then we've got an anti up cork which is negative two thirds, okay? And then a down cork is a negative one third and an anti-down cork is a positive third. Thank goodness you don't have to memorize this table. This is on your data sheet, okay? Um, it's always bothered me that um, the antis have opposite charges to each other. It, it internally confusing. So where's my data sheet? I put it over here. So you have a lovely table, ladies and gentlemen, which is right down there. Okay. So you see there's all of this data right there. So you don't have to memorize any of it. Okay. Well, technically speaking, because in uh, June of 2020, there are no diplomas because of COVID. Thank you, COVID. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, principle number seven. Okay. Law of conservation of charge. So, you can put in all sorts of combinations of quarks together to make up protons and neutrons based on our conservation of charge. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, our stable matter, okay, our stable matter, so your protons and neutrons, can only be composed of up and down quarks, okay? No antimatter quarks, no anti quarks, okay? Unstable matter will contain at least one anti quark. Sounds good? All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us go and look at protons and neutrons here to see, well, what they're made of. Now, remember, ladies and gentlemen, that our, because these are stable matter, they can only be made of 
up and down quarks, no anti quarks. Okay, so I could only work with a positive two thirds, and I can only work with negative one third. So those are the only options that I can work with. Well, a proton has a charge that is equal to positive one. Okay, let's write this in a more in a nice form. Okay, well, if you sit and play around with this, you can find that, well, if I go positive two thirds plus positive two thirds plus negative one third, well, you add that up, ladies and gentlemen, and we get plus one. Two plus two is four minus one. Well, that gives us three, which is three over three, which is equal to one. So, well, guess what? Your positive two over three is equal to an up quark. So two up quarks and a down quark is going to give me a proton. Sounds good? All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a neutron has a charge of zero. And now remember, I can only work with your lovely up and downs. You cannot use anti-ups or anti-downs, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So, well, a positive, whoops, that's the wonkiest two. There we go. So positive two over three. Well, if I add a negative one over three plus a negative one over three, what this gives me is two minus one minus one, which is zero over three, which is equal to zero. So here I have one up quark and two down quarks. Sounds good? Awesome. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, that and this can also be used to look at explaining beta decay as well. So if we're going to write this um, negative beta decay in nucleons, so a neutron okay, is going to be converted into a proton plus your lovely electron and this guy. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, when we're looking at this here with our, our antineutrino, ladies and gentlemen, well, when we go from neutron to proton, well, how does that happen? Well, what if, how it happens is, well, when we look at a neutron, when we drew a neutron above, you have an up quark and two down quarks. So, well, a proton, ladies and gentlemen, is made of two up quarks and a down quark, and then we get our released electron and your antineutrino. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what happens is look at this guy. One of the quarks, that is a down quark, becomes an up quark. There you go. Cool, hey? Yeah. So we can also look at this for our beta positive decay. So here's our proton. And with beta positive decay, our proton is going to become a neutron and a positron, which is your beta positive. And then we're going to have our neutrino. Well, let's write this out, ladies and gentlemen. Well, remember, a proton is two up quarks and a down quark. And a neutron is an up quark and two down quarks, and which would then give us our positron and our neutrino. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what happened here is an up quark turned into a down quark. And how and why that happens? That, ladies and gentlemen, it's another day. All right. I really hope you enjoyed that, ladies and gentlemen. We got some practice problems here for you. We've got a list of practice problems there for your workbook, so I'll give some of those a shot. And that is officially the end of Physics 30. I uh, know, the last of your high school physics. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I heartily enjoyed being able to teach you guys. Um, and I'm just sad that so much of it had to, this semester had to be online through YouTube videos uh, as opposed to in class. 
in class is always so much more fun. All right, ladies and gentlemen, no fires, injuries, or explosions, and have a good day. We'll talk to you later. That might be the last time you actually hear me say that. I know. <laughs> have a good day, guys. Talk to you later. Bye. Now I can't turn this thing off. All right. Bye, guys.